I know there were some fairly complicated little bits there in the covariate, the linear model expressions, the model notation, those LOD scores, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on with the LOD scores. But if nothing else sticks in your mind, uh, I hope this picture will stick in your mind that, oh, there's an effect in the males but not in the females. That's what we're looking for, a gene that only has an effect in the males. Uh, moving on. I like to talk about multiple QTL methods. So far, we've dealt with the idea of scanning the genome, looking for one QTL at a time. But there are some advantages to looking for multiple QTLs. And one is, uh, this is a bit obtuse, but it's to reduce the variation. If we can take account of one QTL, maybe after accounting for it, the other QTLs would become easier to detect. So that's one reason for thinking about multiple QTLs. There's some more important reasons. Sometimes a single chromosome has multiple QTLs on it. They're called linked QTLs. They're linked on the same chromosome. And we have to be able to separate them. Failing to do that, we might fool ourselves. We might think that there's a single locus that we're looking for on a chromosome when really there are two or more. And we need to be aware of that if we're trying to find genes. We need to know how many we're looking for. And the third, and I think most interesting one, is so that we can detect genetic interactions among genes. This is called epistasis. Multiple QTL modeling is computationally challenging, and it involves a long-standing general unsolved problem in statistics that's called model search and selection. So there is no final definitive answer to the multiple QTL methods. Uh, we do the best we can, and we do pretty good. So I'd like to remind you we talked uh, last time about a particular cross that was a, a B by A back cross and we measured blood pressure and this is the genome scan from that blood pressure cross. Uh, there was a nice high peak on chromosome 4 and I'd like to point out that there's also something on chromosome 1. In fact if you look at that chromosome 1 it looks like it has a nice double peak. And so I want to just plant the question in your mind already that um, maybe there are two QTLs on chromosome 1. Maybe. There's certainly something on chromosome 4. And the way we detected these things is by looking at them one at a time. Now, if I decided there's something on chromosome 4, I could actually go to the marker nearest the peak and I could pull out the genotype data for that marker and I could use it as a covariate. I can just plug it into that expression to the regression equation and compute a new LOD score treating my chromosome 4 locus as a covariate. In this case I'm going to look at it as an additive covariate and here I'm showing you in dotted lines what the genome scan looked like previously the picture you just saw where there's a nice high peak on chromosome 4. But if I take the chromosome 4 QTL and I use it as a covariate, the chromosome 4 goes away. And the thing that happens is because I take account of the variation on chromosome 4, I actually have more power to detect the effect on chromosome 1. And the curve on chromosome 1 has gone up substantially. Uh, this isn't too exciting. We already knew there was something on chromosome 1. But for example, if the chromosome 1 had been a marginal call, maybe conditioning on chromosome 4 would have been the thing to do that would have put us over the lip and said, oh, chromosome 1 is really interesting. It could very well have gone the other way. Chromosome 1 could have become less interesting after we accounted for chromosome 4. The process here is something that we would call forward stepwise search. So we started with chromosome 4, we put that into our model, then we found something on chromosome 1, we could keep going. We could put chromosome 1 into our model and then we could keep going and at some point we have to stop and I think we would stop when we don't see any more high peaks. This is a very nice method for detecting QTLs but it only will detect QTLs that have those additive type covariate effects. If the QTL effect on chromosome 1 just adds to the effect of chromosome 4 and the next QTL adds to the effect of that. And I'd like to at least 
plant in your mind the idea that QTLs might not additively interact. Here's a made up effect plot, si simply a cartoon to illustrate a point. The phenotype on the y-axis, the QTL1 genotype on the x-axis, and then three different lines showing me the different effects of QTL2. The thing to notice about the lines is that they're all parallel. So QTL2, I should say the other way around, QTL1 increases the phenotype independently of the state of QTL2. All those curves have the same shape. QTL1 always goes up by the same amount as you go from A to H and again from H to B. It's also true that the QTL2 effect is the same regardless of the QTL1 genotype. The spacing between the lines shows me the QTL2. So as I go from A to H, as I go from H to B, the phenotype is increasing and that increase is the same in amount no matter what the QTL1 genotype is. This is the characteristic of additive QTL effects. Anything else is non-additive or epistatic. So in this example, you can see that the QTL2 effect, the spacing between the lines, is relatively small when QTL1 is A or H. But the QTL2 effect is greatly amplified when QTL1 is a B. The effect of QTL2 depends on the genotype at QTL1. The argument goes the other way around too. QTL1 has a big effect, illustrated by the slope of the line here, when QTL2 is a B, has a much smaller effect, flatter lines, when QTL2 is H or A. So that illustrates uh, non-additive or epistatic QTLs. When you have possibly two QTLs that could be epistatic, there are more models to consider. Remember the null model. That's the model that says the phenotype is just noise. The single QTL model says that the phenotype is explained by one QTL. The additive QTL model says that the phenotype is explained by two QTLs and that the effect of those QTLs add together. And then the full model is that there are two QTLs and that the effect of one depends on the other. And so I include an interaction term. If I had sex as a covariate, by the way, I could add sex in additively. We don't need to go there today, but we could add it in interactively. There's a lot of complexity that can emerge from this. So these are kind of the entry-level multi-QTL uh, strategy is to think about two QTLs at a time. Now if I have four different models that describe the blood pressure, the trait, then I have a lot of different ways to compare them. And I'm going to show you what those are. The first one is called the additive QTL scan. I'm simply going to ask whether the two QTLs, Q1 plus Q2, explain the QTL better than a null model. I'm also going to look at this one, which is called the additive versus one, additive versus signal. This compares whether two QTLs are better than one. I like that. We're going to decide whether two QTLs are better than one. Well, it might be the case that the two QTLs are better than one if they're additive, but it might be the case that really we have to consider epistatic QTLs. So if I want to know whether there are epistatic QTLs, I can ask the full model question, whether two QTLs plus the interaction explains the data better than nothing. I could ask the question whether two QTLs with interaction explain the phenotype better than one QTL, and I could ask the question whether the interaction is important for the two QTLs to explain the phenotype. You can tell from 
the mouthful that that was to explain that this is a conceptually challenging um, enterprise to look at the all pairs genome scan and I don't expect it to be understood in a day. I really strongly refer you to the Broman and Sen book where there's a wonderful uh, written description of this uh, process of sorting out your all pairs genome scan. I'm going to move on and show you the best thing that everybody loves about the all pairs genome scan is that you can make these beautiful pictures. This is a picture of a LOD score. Now your other LOD scores had an x-axis that was the chromosome and then there was a LOD score on the y-axis so you got kinda got this profile line. But here I need to consider two loci at a time. So my x-axis is a location and my y-axis is also a location and then I have a z-axis the scale is over here that's indicated by color so think of the LOD curve here as coming out of the page the very high peaks are bright red the very low areas are blue and so right here at this peak that's the at the intersection of chromosome 1 and chromosome 4 I see a bright red spot that tells me that there's a high LOD score at the intersections of chromosomes 1 and 4 this happens to be the full LOD score, which is the one that compares two QTLs plus interaction to the null model. So I know that one and four are good explanations in that model. I also have, um, since I actually only need half of the square to get all the pairs here, I can, I can plot two different LOD scores on the same graph. And in the upper triangle of this graph, I have the interaction LOD score. This is the, the part of the LOD score that just ask whether I need that interaction. And if I go over here to the intersection of one and four, it's kind of dull green, and I, I don't think that's very exciting. The scale here tells me that that's about one and a half. So, okay, the interaction's not that exciting. But, by the way, there's a red spot here. I'd like to point out that the way these figures are drawn, there's always a red spot you have to pay attention to the scale. In this case the red spot is four, five, it's actually like four and a half which over time you'll hopefully develop some sense of what an interesting LOD score is but I can assure you four is an interesting LOD score. That red spot is worth looking at and I'd like to point out where it is. It's at the intersection between 15 and I should say the intersection between 15 and 6. So chromosomes 15 and 6 might be interesting. Let's go on. Actually, I have zoomed in here, and I'm showing you just the interesting chromosomes now, 1, 4, 6, and 15. The interaction uh, part of the figure is the same, so I could zoom in on that red spot a little bit. On the bottom, I showed you a different LOD score here. This is full versus 1, so this compares the full model to the single QTL model. You can do A versus 1. You can look at any of them. I just chose this one to look at. And it, sure enough, shows me a nice red spot at the intersection between chromosomes 1 and 4. Now, having spent all that time looking at and interpreting the pictures, I'm going to have to tell you that the pictures are really not the best way to make sense of a pair scan. They look beautiful. Um, one way to make sense is to uh, find the peaks, I'll show you in a moment how to find them, uh, and to draw some effect plots. The first effect plot that I'm going to show you corresponds to that red spot between chromosomes 1 and 4. On the y-axis I have blood pressure, on the x-axis I have the chromosome 4 genotype, and then I have two lines for the BB and the BA genotypes at chromosome 1. And I'd like you to notice that those lines are pretty parallel. And from my previous discussion, you should be saying, oh, you could read actually the header of the figure here. Those are additive QTLs. The effect of chromosome 1 adds to the effect of chromosome 4. And it doesn't matter what the genotype of chromosome 4 is. Chromosome 1, the BB genotype, still increases blood pressure by about the same amount, about 5 millimeters of mercury. 
If I jump over here to chromosome 6 and 15, I see a different story. Certainly the lines are not parallel. In fact, uh, the chromosome 15 locus is on the x-axis. And if I look at the effect of chromosome 15 when the chromosome 6 genotype is BB, I see there's a pretty flat line. So when chromosome 6 has the BB genotype, chromosome 15 doesn't change the blood pressure has no effect. But when chromosome 6 has the BA genotype, chromosome 15, this very steep line, has a pretty big effect on blood pressure. In fact, it changes the blood pressure, uh, the BB genotype at about 107 down to the BA genotype at about 100. It changes the blood pressure by about 7 millimeters of mercury, which is as big as the chromosome 4 genotype. And if you remember the genome scan, we saw chromosome 4 and we saw chromosome 1, but we didn't see 6 and 15 at all until we started looking at the pairs. That's why we look at pairs, so that we can find these things. There's something else about chromosome 6 and 15. Whatever the genes are, whatever they are, I actually don't know on chromosome 6 and chromosome 15, they have to talk to each other somehow. Somehow the gene that's being expressed on chromosome 15 has to know what state the gene at chromosome 6 is. So there's an implication here that there's a molecular interaction between those gene products. I think that's the coolest thing about epistasis, is that it tells us more than just that there are QTLs at a certain location. It tells us that they talk to each other in some way and understanding that way and understanding what those genes are is um, a challenge and a mystery.